Well, let's begin. We are finishing some of the characteristics of the Holy Spirit, words that prove to us that the Holy Spirit is a person and not an it. And we're ready for page five. It's the one with the box about blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And we're going to look at the uh, top part of it and then discuss blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Um, We closed last week, I think, with us all saying that we felt comfortable and we're coming to realize the spirit within us, not physical, but something of God. And we've seen already 13 things that the spirit has done or does. Uh, The next one, he indicate and predicts. The Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. Um, It's hard to imagine the Spirit of Christ, and yet if we can come to grips with the Holy Spirit, then that's easier. Um, The Spirit of Christ represents that ability he had, guided by the Spirit, to give information, to indicate, uh, to look at things to come. Uh, Revelation 22, 17, uh, and the Spirit and the bride say, come. So the Spirit invites. The Spirit invites. How does he do it? through the Word, through individuals, through us sharing what we have learned and what we understand with others. Uh, if, if I encourage Terry to invite someone to something and she offers that invitation on my behalf, that's not unusual. It ought not to be unusual when we see something like this happening as far as the Godhead. Um, Christ acting on the Spirit's behalf or the Spirit acting on Christ's behalf. And again, it's not so much that we have to totally understand it. We don't have to repeat these 16 things by memory. It's just really coming to grips with the role of the Spirit of God in our life and in others' life. Uh, The one I like, Romans 8, 7, uh, verse 14, And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Uh, This is when he went to be tempted. God's Spirit led Jesus there. Forty days, forty nights, tempted of Satan. We have a record of three of those temptations. We would be amiss to think that there were just three. Uh, It was likely a forty-day process of temptations uh, in terms of what was going on. A person can engage in each of these activities while a mere force cannot. Thus, the Holy Spirit should be seen as a person. And it's just kind of ring it at home as best that it can, uh, the notes to help us to understand that. How do you mistreat the Holy Spirit? Yep. Well, the, the notes, let's, let's use their words and then we'll talk about it. Uh, Blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever shall speak against the Spirit shall not be forgiven him either in this age or in the age to come. Uh, I want us to turn to Matthew 12 and put two verses in their context because they're quoted in the box at the bottom. This is a question that comes up all the time when you're discussing the concept of the Holy Spirit. And unless you've studied it recently, and unless you're really firm in your understanding of it, most 
Christians believe that there's something that they could do that cannot be forgiven. Now, the verse says something cannot be forgiven. But when you understand what it's saying, all you have to do is repent. And there's always forgiveness. So anytime you're discussing this concept of not having the ability to be forgiven of something, if you're in Christ and you ask for forgiveness, it's guaranteed. There's no question about that. If it were questionable, we would have no security as Christians. If it were questionable, we don't want to even consider that because we want and God wants us to have security in our salvation. Uh, Matthew 12, let's read 24 through 27. The Pharisees heard this, and he had driven a demon out of a man. It is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Now, what did they just do? Who did they give credit to? Who's the head of demons? Beelzebub, but in the Greek, it's Bezebol or Bezebal, but it's associating Satan driving out part of himself. And Jesus lays the understanding before us. He says, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? So if we didn't understand what they were saying, Jesus just told us, didn't he? You're saying that Satan's against himself. How can Satan's kingdom, evil, stand if what's happening is true? Now, what did they uh, what would motivate them to say such a thing? They don't want to acknowledge God. They did not ever want to acknowledge who Jesus was. That he had the power to drive out demons. They did not want to acknowledge that. And so they offer this response. If I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your people drive them out? So then, they will be your judges. I've never understood exactly what Jesus was asking of them. He was associating them with evil, no question. And I guess he's, he's laying it alongside their shoulders to, it's not me, it's Satan. And if you're suggesting something different, you're in allegiance with evil if you will. But if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So his comment is refuting their statement, and he's getting to the core of their motivation. The core of their motivation. Uh, if I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. If you can acknowledge that if you will see that, if you'll believe that. And then, or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can rob his house. Now that's just a physical circumstance that could go on in their physical life, and ours for that matter. He who is not with me is against me. He's looking them straight in the eye and talking firm. And he who does not gather with me scatters. So he's, he's forcing them to see themselves, to see their motivations. He's pointing it out clearly. And so I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men 
but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. I think the better translation can be forgiven. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, even in this age or in the age to come. Look at the bottom two paragraphs at the bottom of the big box. Let's read them and then we'll talk about it. Blaspheming is more than rejecting the word of the Holy Spirit. It is speaking against the Holy Spirit so as to discredit His work or persuade others that His work is coming from an evil source. And that, of course, is what they had done. No one would do this lightly. A malicious intent would have to be in the heart of the one who would act in this manner. Anyone who devotes himself to this behavior cannot be forgiven in this age or in the age to come. He's committing an eternal sin. Let's read the next paragraph and then make some comments. Blasphemy the Holy Spirit includes three offenses, having a malicious attitude toward the Holy Spirit, speaking evil against him or about him to others, and seeking to influence others to reject his work and to believe that it comes from an evil source. Now, to me, he's given three statements that are the same thing. I want to add one to it that's not found in this box. What have we seen 16 times about the Holy Spirit? Last week, 13 times and four times tonight, uh, actually three times. Indicate, predict, invite, lead. What is Scripture telling us about the Spirit of God? It's involved in our life. It wants to speak to us. It wants to guide us. It wants to invite us. It wants to all of these 16 things. If I reject it, who am I rejecting? Lindita? God. You're rejecting God. And when you reject God and the guidance provided by God through the Spirit, how can you get forgiveness? And if you treat holy as something unholy, how can you be forgiven? And that's, to me, the better example of what blaspheming is. You're treating something holy as if it's unholy. And then, the 16 aspects that we've seen, the Spirit within us and through the Word and through the guidance of others who study the Word and are guided by the Spirit. If I just reject it, and let me add a word because it's important, finally... If I reject it once and for all, I can't be forgiven for whatever the Spirit would be trying to tell me, guide me against, uh, uh, teach me. If you yield to it, one of those 16 points, you have the opportunity to make it right. You have the opportunity because you're not rejecting the Spirit, you're yielding to it. You're listening. You're being changed. You're acknowledging wrong in your life. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit is when you say once and for all, no. And it never changes. And you're treating something holy as unholy. Something of worth as of no worth. Something with whole, uh, eternal life attached to it as if you don't care. So is there any sin that you confess that you will not be forgiven for? Say no and shake your head. So don't think, oh no, I, I've done something so bad, God cannot forgive me. Who is talking to you in that regard? Which little voice on your shoulder in the cartoons is talking to you? It's Satan talking to you. He's the accuser. 
Satan the accuser. He wants you to feel your guilt. And I, I've said it. I, I don't know how else to say it. If something within you, whatever you've said, whatever you've done, I don't care how bad you are, as a Christian, if something within you is saying you can't get forgiveness, you can't go to worship, they will never forgive you, don't ever go into that building at Lashon Street ever again because they're all watching you and they're remembering who you are and what you've done. You might as well. Who is that talking to you? It's not God. God is drawing you back. God wants you to come back. The love of Christ because of God is say, telling you just the opposite. Seven times 70 in a single day, you forgive someone. You think God has a number? Satan wants you to think, I've done it now. I can't be forgiven. And you're, re you're listening to him who is a spirit but it's not the Holy Spirit, the Trinity of God, that's telling you different through Scripture, through others, and even your conscience, if you'll listen to it. If you'll let your conscience tell you right and wrong. And how do we guide our conscience? From God's Word telling us to distinguish between those things. Oh, I've only had it happen twice in my life where I've had to talk really firm to someone who had listened to Satan so long they just did not think they could ever be right before God. They, they had done things that would never be made right. Did you repent of them? Are you in Christ? Why would you think that? And ultimately, and it did take long, ultimately they just... It's as if, my dad used to say, when you're teaching a class, you can sometimes tell on the faces of those listening that there's a light bulb up there. You know in the cartoons, what does the light bulb represent? Enlightenment, or the, I've got an idea, or I'm starting to understand what you're saying. He says you'll see people as if there's a light bulb there. And sometimes I find myself, I, I see a light bulb there. What did you want to say? You can just see it. And it's as if a light bulb, I mean, a, a, an idea finally found its home. And both times they just took a deep breath and their shoulders relaxed and they finally began to get it. It doesn't happen overnight because they believed that life for so long. But they finally began to realize you don't believe God. If you believe that, you're listening to Satan. And it's so obvious when they see it. And, of course, it would be nice if they saw it the first hour when they started down that path. We sometimes are slow learners. I have said that a few times in my life. We're slow learners. But then we get it, and we're thankful. Tommy? One of the things that you have to remind people of when they're think they've done something that they can't be forgiven of is the Apostle Paul. Yes. If anybody can be forgiven, would think they wouldn't be forgiven, it was the Apostle Paul. If you look at what happened to Stephen and all of the other people that he murdered and yeah. conspired against, yet he got forgiveness and grace, therefore anybody should be able to do it. And to his credit, when did he get it? On the road to May, uh, to Damascus. When he saw the light, there you go, T. When he saw the light and Christ spoke to him, why are you persecuting me? When he got it, he got it. Now, how do we know he got it? Look at his life. He died for the cause of Christ. He went through, read 1 Corinthians 12 and see that long list of physical things he went through. And he did not yield ever again to what at one point he believed. This is an this is a imposter. He's not here for the right reason. He's telling lies. He's leading Judaism astray. And he got it. And there's nothing that tells us he ever had doubt 
when he was immersed in water and forgiven after being taught that he ever looked back and felt as if he had not been forgiven. He believed God and he knew that God saw him as he saw the blood of Christ applied to his life. That's the reason people have doubts. Uh, Vern? You know, I think one of the things that, you know, they say there are consequences of sin, and I think getting over your guilt is one of the hardest hurdles for you to get over. And yeah. that guilt keeps coming back and coming back, and, you know, that kind of clouds your mind as to, how, if I can't forgive me, how can God forgive me? Yeah. And I think I've shared with you an occasion where a gentleman at a former congregation would come forward and he would acknowledge sin. And because I knew him, I would say that prayer for him uh, before the congregation. And then I would go straight to him because he sat in front of me every Sunday morning and it was right there. And I would go straight to him and say, now you forgive yourself. Because I knew that was an issue with him. He had trouble forgiving himself. He did what he's supposed to do. He acknowledged it, and he let people that would never have known it. It was really a private thing, but he also wanted prayers. I had not been the person I should be. I need, I need your prayers, whatever it might be. Now forgive yourself. And uh, that's difficult for some people. Uh, so I, was it Dorothy? It's Satan wants you. It slows you down. Have you ever come to a fork in the road, and even if it's close, even if there's two paths within just a few feet of each other, have you ever tried to run down both paths? <laughs> Think of the Christian walk and Satan's walk. See yourself at, and remember the thing we learned in sports and other places, I suppose. If something is off that much here, as it goes forward, it's going to eventually be a mile apart. And the principle is true if you're just a little bit off in your appreciation of the grace of God. And you're just a little bit off about your taking care of the guilt. And boy, what I did was terrible. And I've done it before. I don't know better. But just a little bit off. Satan loves it. Because you're off that path just a little bit. But Dorothy suggested it's true, and then it becomes worse, becomes more. It happens more often. Mm -hmm. So listen to the urgings. My word, it wasn't in any of these this 16 lists, but implied. Listen to the urging when you read Scripture, or as people are teaching and preaching, or you're studying with a group, wow, I really needed that. And if you felt that, if you sensed that in Scripture or something that was said, what do you need to do immediately and for a long, long time? Take it in and let it have the effect. If you really needed it, someone hit a nerve. And it can be a good nerve. It can be a good thing. Stan? Yeah. Tommy? So there's a there was a Greek mythology character called Sisyphus. And Sisyphus is the one in mythology who's rolling the big boulder up the hill. And when he gets up to the top, it comes back down and he has to roll it again up the hill. Eternity, rolling it up the hill. If we don't forgive ourselves of our sins, you know, when we ask for forgiveness and repentance, 
we're always trying to push that guilt boulder up the hill. Yeah. And we're never going to be successful getting it to the top of the hill. It's just going to always roll down and crush us. And then when our spirits are crushed, we have to be able to forgive ourselves. Very important point. Well, in sports and other aspects of life, uh, if you're going to be successful, you have to quit playing the what-if game. Yeah. What if? And when you do that, what are you doing? Doubting. You're doubting and you're thinking of the past. Can you undo it? Uh, would it be nice if we could, uh, hindsight's 2020. Wouldn't it be nice if we had 2020 when that happened? We didn't. And what if? Each of the examples and the comments that have been said, we don't need to play that game. What if? Well, if you knew then what you know now, but you didn't. And make it right. And get your focus on what you are about now and what you're wanting to do in the future. Living in the past doesn't help. It won't work. You can't change a thing. Now, what's the value of looking at the past? You learn. You learn from it. Uh, I don't remember who said it now. History is bunk. Uh, someone quoted that in something I read some time ago. Uh, they were wrong because we learn from history. And that's what's wrong with our culture right now. The, the uh, woke culture. Let's just remove everything from our past that shouldn't have happened and let's chastise all of that and let's take all of that away and what are we going to do? We're possibly going to find ourselves in a circumstance, maybe not this year, but in some years ahead when it's all removed from history, it's all removed from the awareness of a whole new generation of people, we tend to do things again. There's nothing new under the sun, Solomon said. We learn from history, and to erase it is not the right thing. Learn from it. Keep it there to always be pounding it into your consciousness. We're not doing that again. As a country, as a family, as a community, however it would apply. Uh, Terry, Jan, you want to comment too? And this is where the scriptures come into our help. If we're in the scriptures often, they come to mind. Take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, think about what is true and noble. For the Honest, what is true, trustworthy. Not what you think is true, but what has really happened. And then Paul says, I don't, uh, I, some things I, I don't let the past, I stretch forward to the yeah. future. Philippians 3. Yeah. Uh, one of those two people sitting before me one day in a church office uh, was getting ready to tell me things that I knew were going to be shaded from her lack of understanding of who, what, when, and where. Let me just say it that way. They may be watching tonight, so I have to be careful. Uh, I said, well, let's apply something. Terry just quoted the verse. Whatsoever is true, it really happened. My dad used to say to young people, when you go to a four-year-old or a seven-year-old and say, tell me the truth, they don't have any idea what you're saying. <laughs> what he would say, and he taught me, apparently I needed it, tell me what really happened. Tell me what really happened. Well, I was doing this, and, and, and then this happened, and then I heard this. And truth isn't something a lot of people understand. What really happened? And one of those two people, just simply beginning there, tell me what's true. Did this really happen? Well, no, I just heard. Somebody just told me. Did it, do you know that it really happened? And the 50 minutes or an hour that we would have spent changed drastically. And it's a very worthwhile endeavor that we go through. Did this really happen? Tell me what's true. And then those other characteristics. 
you have you have a whole new positive light to things. You don't let your mind go into the gutter, but you keep it on heavenly things. You take it captive, as Terry said. And uh, you've been very patient. I hope you remember your thought. I, I was rehearsing in my head. <laughs> <laughs> uh, instead of the, the phrase you mentioned, instead of the what if, we should be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, even if. Absolutely. Yeah, boy, that's powerful too. And that's really hard, isn't it? God has the ability, but even if he doesn't, I'm going to do what's right. I'm not going to bow down to those idols. I'm going to serve God Jehovah. Uh, yeah, that's the that's great point. If we leave now, that's the one we should leave with, I suppose. Uh, even if. But uh, we read uh, John 13 a few weeks ago in the context of another discussion but on that occasion, Jesus was teaching the point that things don't happen because we're sinners. And remember the ones on the way to offer sacrifices and Pilate shed their blood? Were they more guilty than other Galileans who were doing the same thing that day? Remember when the Tower of Siloam fell on those people? Were they more guilty than others? No. On both cases, those things did not happen because they were willful sinners. And I inject the word because we're all sinners. But if you think there's something in your life that needs to be forgiven and you're thinking this is happening, I've lost my job, what did I do? I must have sinned against God. No, you didn't. That's not why it happened. But if you think something happened that's caused something bad to happen in your life, repent. <clears throat> repent. And so if we start to question, and Satan and others would cause us to question, well, this is happening for so-and-so reason, read four verses of John 13 and realize, no, that's not why it happened, but... If I'm thinking I've done something that could have been so bad that this would have happened, Jesus says, repent. Repent. And what's the guarantee? If we repent, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of that sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. There's the guilt washed away again. Burn? You know, just speaking about this, Physically, it does. And when I finally said, I forgive you, my life changed again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, that. Yeah. Holding a grudge and holding anger inside, not dealing with it, so many areas. There's a long list of about nine things that happen to us physically. Uh, from ulcers and all manner of things. And doctors who, who do the counseling and who see many people who've held on to things, it changes your physical makeup as well as emotional. You can't deal with things in life the same way. Why? Because it's like a weight on your back. That's the euphemism or the metaphor. I've been carrying this weight around Ever tried to carry a 150-pound weight on your back? Just imagine, it's, it's not a small little thing. It's a heavy load. And it, it cripples us. It, it just slows us down. It's not allowing us to be the light and the leaven and the uh, salt that we ought to be. We're dealing with the past and the what-ifs. Uh, can you name something right now? I want you to say it out loud. Please don't. But can you think of something in your life right now, and you could do it if I gave you a minute, that you really wish you could have undone? 
And it doesn't have to be negative. It could be a positive. That you wish you could undo it? I would like to run one race in Knoxville, Tennessee, in the half mile at the regional track meet. I would love to go back and run it again. I was worried about who was behind me, and I missed winning by that much. And I still qualified for the state meet, but I have thought about it so often. And then I have to quit. I can't do anything about it. But evil things... We can all wish that we had seen the fastball sooner if we're on a baseball team or whatever else it is, but evil things are going to slow us down and hurt us. Simple things. Uh, I wish I'd made a study a little bit harder and answered two more questions right. My grade would have been different. I mean, those are regrets that aren't going to trouble us forever. They're not going to slow us down and hurt us unless we do that in too many things, I guess. I should say that. I saw a hand. Tara, was it you? I was thinking of uh, the acapella song, Roll That Stone Away. You talk about that stone. Let God roll the stone away. Yeah. He rolled it away. Christ yeah. came out. <laughs> yeah, roll the stone away, acapella, Terry says. Uh, let's go to the next four. Two of them speak to the same issue. We're at the top of the box. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Acts 5. Ananias and Sapphira, they saw the example of Barnabas and others who sold property and brought the money to the apostles to be used for good. Ananias and Sapphira apparently had a piece of property. They sold it. They gave half of it, but they lied to the people without saying words. So therefore they lied to the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God knew they kept half of it and they wanted people to think they'd given it all. And they had every right to sell the property and keep half of it. It was a magnanimous thing that they did to give half of the money, but they wanted credit for something they did not do. And what did... God do to Ananias when Peter confronted him. He struck him dead. And Ananias comes in, uh, Sapphira comes in just after the people carried her husband out and she essentially said the same thing and she too was struck dead. And I've always suggested Peter wanted the first century church, that first generation of Christians to know do not tell lies. Even if you get away with them, who knows it? The Spirit of God. God knows it. And it, he, it had to be dealt with in a very visible, overt way. Um, I don't understand it. Except that gives me, if there's a reasoning, that seems to be the reason. This is the first weeks and months of the first century church. And it was a lesson that had to be understood. Um, resisted, you men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. Now, what characteristic has he just described to someone who's just pushing the Spirit away? They don't want to be urged. They don't want to be invited. They don't want to be... Uh, compelled. They don't want all of these 16 actions on the part of the Spirit in their life. And how are they described? If anyone ever says to you, you're stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you're going to say, what Bible have you been reading? And what are you talking about? But I think we're going to have an idea. That's not how we should be responding to God's teachings. And that's what it is. We're responding to God as if he doesn't matter. We're rejecting, resisting as if it's not important. And you know what? What did we learn a while back? God is a jealous God. He's a jealous God. He has every right to be in first place, treated in first place, treated, I've got five minutes, treated 
with the reverence and the glory and the honor he deserves and he's earned and we resist it and these would give us physical characteristics that may come to mind grieving don't grieve the spirit of God I think it's the same idea of just turning your back on it uh, you're just not listening uh, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption the spirit has a purpose and the seal, uh, any of you ever driven trucks across country? What do, or I've unloaded a few trucks when Terry and I were married. Uh, we loaded Samsonite furniture in Murfreesboro, and when it's all loaded up and the invoice is ready to go with the driver, what do they do? They put a seal on it, and what's the purpose? If, when that arrives at the place it's going, if that seal is broken, you know something's probably missing. Someone's tampered with it. The seal is a guarantee. It's making a statement. And the Spirit is our seal. And we don't need to grieve it. I won't make the metaphor of a seal on the back of a truck. We don't need to strip the Spirit away to take away our security. Well, I guess it just did, didn't I? Um, and insulted... You've insulted the spirit of grace. And Hebrews 10 gives a list of four things. You've treated the blood of Christ as this, and you've done this, and you've done this. It's a powerful statement. And our God is a consuming fire. Don't insult grace. And how is that made known to us? Here, through the Spirit of God. Teaching of God, the example from Scripture, teaching from others who have the indwelling Spirit. Don't insult grace. Take the Spirit out to be sure you get the point. But it's the Spirit of grace. Don't insult it. I think we can do that if we say, God won't forgive me even though I've repented. You don't know grace. Grace is not earned. It's not by your merit. It's something you can never earn by yourself. It's given to us as a gift, and it's up to us to receive it and receive it the way that it's offered to us as it speaks to God and Christ and Christ on the cross and a whole list of wonderful things. Uh, don't act like you can earn it. You're insulting the Spirit who's the participant of grace in your life. Um, hmm. I'm through. We finished the sheet. Mm -hmm. Tommy? So I'm not sure if this happened very much in the California churches, but this, I know this happened in the South. In the 60s, there was a charismatic movement within our brotherhood yep. that involved Pat Boone. Yep. And a lot of other people that tried to introduce stuff into the church. And for a while, the pendulum swung the other way, and nobody ever talked about the Holy Spirit. Nobody ever mentioned the Holy Spirit because then you might be associated with Pat Boone over here. And as a result, for quite a while, I think we may be limited the Holy Spirit by not teaching and talking about it properly. And if we finally left the impact, it's, it's so abused in other ways. The, the grace needs to be sung about, prayed about, taught and talked about. Uh, taught and talked, two things. Uh, we are saved by grace. I'm thankful. I'm thankful. Announcements? Men's. We're going to go to the. No, we're, you can read. You can read that. We're going to go to the next lesson. Uh, you may have picked it up last week. There's more there, and there's two or three weeks worth here. Um, the notes on the table, and unless you got them last week. Uh, I see some people from seven different areas of the world watching us. We're on Facebook tonight, uh, and it's telling me who's watching. Hello, folks. 
Uh, I'll go home and post it to our YouTube page uh, so others who didn't know it's here, but uh, having the telephone connection plus the Wi-Fi is, I think, giving us a good connection. Brian told me the Wi-Fi back here is not steady enough, and I was thinking, well, maybe it will be if, if I use my phone. It has a double connection, not just a Wi-Fi connection, and I think it's worked. I think it's worked. Um, Tommy? Uh, sunshine bag items are due by Sunday, September 18th. So sunshine bag stuff. That's coming up very quickly. Life group three is meeting. I do not beg. I do not use guilt. But it's an opportunity, first of all, to be with brothers and sisters in Christ and to have a great meal and come figure out what is that dessert that this person is going to stand in the hall and he's going to show us to encourage us to come eat that day. Uh, I have my guess what it might be. I don't know, but I think I know with a, such a definitive statement that this is everybody's favorite. I can only think of one that fits in that category. <laughs> Well, I kind of had to do a switcheroo because uh -oh. I was going to make the real fancy dessert, but we're just getting back from the retreat Saturday night, yeah. so I had to do a little swap, and the big fancy dessert will be in October, oh, okay. which, by the way, will be a congregational yeah. potluck oh, for yeah. Rachel and no, yeah. no, for Ryan. Ryan and his wife. Yeah, yeah. which is the third Sunday? Yes. Yes. The yeah. third Sunday so for that last week? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah. Yeah. Um, Burn, lead us in prayer if you would. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the opportunity that we have to come together to discuss and to under, get a better understanding of your word. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your word that we can go through this life with our eyes wide open rather than wide shut. We pray that the enlightenment that we get tonight will further that and to help us to walk in, in what right direction. We pray, Father, that you be with us as we depart and go our separate ways. Be with those, Father, who are going through struggles, especially in our uh, in the church. Continue to be with those who are having medical problems and or who are going to have medical procedures. Continue to guide and direct us and we pray, Father, that And how does he guide and direct us? Through his word and through his indwelling spirit. Thank you.